All right, welcome to the solution video for task two, the Hidato problem. So let's get going. So again, we want to open up the hidato.nzp file. And you can see that's opened up a starting point for the model, uh, some simple data and more data files. Okay, so this is the first time that we've got data files in our model. So one thing we can do right from the beginning is we just run run and check with the starting model on the smallest data file. Okay, so we can see that it ran. Um, we found out that we weren't <laughs> following the rules, so we got an incorrect answer. I mean, we've basically filled everything in with one, but everything's working so far. So let's think about the Hidato problem. So basically our decision variables Right, for each row and column, we've got to put a number from one to m times n. And the first constraint that we need is that they all need to be different. So if we write this, depending on, it should actually work as is, but I'll show you what to do if it doesn't. So the first thing we want is all different. So let's always save, run with the smallest data. So you can now at least see they're all different, although it's still incorrect. Um, in older versions of MiniZinc, all different wasn't set up. See, all different ones were one dimensional array. So you need to put this array 1D wrapper around it, which will convert the two dimensional array we have here, right? Two dimensional array into a one dimensional array. So it's not gonna make any difference here. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the kind of easy part of the Hidato problem. The next, the hard part is every number, all the numbers, the number before and after it have to be adjacent to it. So let's try and do this with just the description of the variables we've got for ourselves. So what we're going to need to, to look at is if we look at all the numbers, right? So let's say for all n in one to n times n minus one, the number one plus to it has to be somewhere adjacent. So, okay, actually let's do it differently. Let's look across all the rows. Now, <clears throat> So if we look at the value XRC, right, that's a number. We need to find somewhere nearby the one which is one more than it. So what we need to do is look across all of the things which are nearby. So we can do this by saying, let's say exists a delta R in minus one to one, a delta column in minus one to one, Right, so these are the differences from the row and the column. So there has to be something nearby which equals this plus one. Right, so someone nearby, so this is the row plus delta row and the column plus delta column. So let's look at this again. It says, for every row and column, so we look at the, the value in that row and column, if we add one to it, so then there has to be, so there has to be some delta row, delta column, so something within minus one plus one of this, which is the value plus one. And notice if both dr and dc are zero, this will just try to say that the, the, the same position takes the same value, but that's okay, it won't hold, but it doesn't invalidate what's going on here. Okay, we need to do the same for the minus one as well. Well, actually we probably don't because as long as this one is next to the one that's plus one, then this one's next to the one which is minus one. So let's see what happens if we run that. Okay, so there's some warnings going on here. So we've got array access out of bounds. So you can think about it, obviously, right? Obviously, um, if, if the row is one and we tied a delta row of minus one, we're gonna look at row zero. 
And then MiniSync will say, well, that's false, right? So if you try to look up minus row zero, it'll say it's false. But so it says there's no solution. So, okay, this is the worst kind of thing that happens in a modeling problem is that we get no solution. So those warnings actually don't matter because if we try to look up something off the map and it says no, then, then that's okay because we, we're forcing it to look for someone which, which does look on the map, okay? So the problem is different. The problem is what if XRC is the last possible number, right? What if it takes the value M times N? Then actually we, there's no position which would take plus one, right? So we need either XRC takes the last possible value, which is small M, right? Or the plus one value is somewhere, right? So we need to get rid of that last possible value. Let's hope that works. Okay, no, it says incorrect. Seven not equal, oh, okay, we've forgotten about the clues. Of course, remember, if we look at the data, we have to force some of these people to be in the right position, which is probably something we should have done earlier, because that's a much easier constraint to do. So let's do the clues. So basically, we need to look across the clue stuff and set all, so setting values to their clue values is easy, right? We look across all rows and columns, and basically if, if clue, right comma C is greater than zero, so remember if it's zero, it doesn't say anything, then we can say that X of RC equals clue of RC. Oops. All right, remember you need an end if. For every if in music, you need an end if. That gets rid of a dangling else problem. So let's see if that works now. Okay, looking good. Constraint, all constraints hold. We're getting these error messages, but remember this is sort of designed by us. We're saying some of these things will go out of bounds and that's okay. We could stop the error messages, let's try that. So we want to only do this where R plus delta R is a legitimate row, right? And C plus delta C is a legitimate column. So hopefully if we do that, we'll get rid of the error messages. So except that we can't, I can't try and. <laughs> That's how you try and in MiniSync. Okay, let's try now. Okay, you can see now we've got rid of those warning messages that we had earlier. Right, where we're going outside of the legitimate rows and columns by just checking here. So we're saying, don't consider, so don't start looking up XR, XR plus DR values here if they're not in the row and the column. Okay. okay, but that's one way of doing it. So let's have a look. Let's run one of the bigger things. Okay, it's running fairly fast. Okay, there's the last one. H5 is taking quite a while to solve. Okay, a 10 by 10 Hidato. Uh, okay, so this is not the best possible model we can do for this example. So why don't we come back and try to improve our model. All right, so I actually stopped the execution after 56 seconds and found no solution. So this is not a good, uh, not the best model we can think about. <clears throat> so, what do we want to do? We want to have a different view, right? So that, that constraint was very clumsy and ugly. It used a lot of ex exists and or. When you see that being used, it's going to be hard for the solver to tackle. So we want to have a different view of the problem. And the way we're going to do that is have an inverse view. So here we know, if you give me a row and a column, I can tell you what number is there. I want to know, if I give you a number, tell me which row and column it's in. So obviously we're going to have to encode rows and columns in positions, right? So positions are just also the numbers one to m, m times n, but we want, so one, one, the position will be recorded as one, right? One comma m, which is the end of the first row is equal to m, but then two comma one, 
is equal to m plus one. So we're just basically mapping this 2D array into a 1D array, right? <clears throat> so, um, so we're going to have this alternate view of, of the data, an inverse view. So we're going to say for every number, which position is it in? Why? And the critical thing we're going to do to get that is going to use the inverse operator because this array here is going to be the inverse of the X array. So we have to convert X to a 1D array, right? So basically, if you think about X, once you convert it to 1D array, it's basically a position thing that maps from positions to numbers. And that is the inverse of something which maps from numbers to positions. Okay, so now we've got the Y array. Now we, we basically can look up the position for each value. So that's gonna make it much easier to write down the constraint that every position, every number has to be next to its thing. So let's just move from numbers from one to n times n minus one. We're going to say, right? Basically, I want to say something like this. The position, right, of number n is adjacent to the position of number n plus one. Right, and I do that for all pairs of numbers. Basically, I, I don't have the last one here and then I don't go out of bounds. So how do I write adjacent? So this is a predicate, but I'm only going to use it once. So the body of this predicate, could, I could also put inside. Okay, so the predicate adjacent takes two positions. P1, P2, and we have to check if they're adjacent. So when are two positions adjacent? Well, let's um, introduce some local variables which will extract the row. So what's the row of position P1, right? So this is row one. Well, if we take P1, right, and we take its mod and add one. Okay, so in fact, if we take P1, we subtract one, we divide by M, which is the row length, and we add one, that's gonna give us the row. So think about this. If P1 is one, this would be zero div M, which would be zero plus one. If P1 was M, right? This would be M minus one div one, which would be zero plus one. So it'll give me one. If P1 was M plus one, right? This will be M div M, which will be one plus one, which will give me row two. So that'll give me the row of that position. And we can simply work out the column. If we take P1 minus one, mod m plus one, All right? So think about it, if P1 is one, this will be zero mod m, which is zero plus one will be because of column one. If P1 was m, so be m minus one mod m, which will be m minus one plus one, which will be m. If it's m plus one, right, it'll be P minus, it'll be m mod m, which is zero plus one. Right, so that's giving me the right rows and columns. And do the same thing for P2. All right, so row two is P2 plus this, column two, P2 plus this. And now, once I know their rows and columns, then it should be easy to work out if they're adjacent. If I basically add up the difference in the rows and the columns. Well, we need that the rows are less than equal to one. 
right? Because it's diagonal as well. The difference in the rows is less than equal to one. And the difference in the columns. Let's see one. All right. So let's see if that works first. Oops. Well, let's get rid of some syntax errors, which are already being highlighted there by the error. Can't open file inverse.mzn. Well, because I put a comma there. So, okay, let's run on the smallest data first. Okay, that seems to work. Let's run on bigger data. Actually, you can do it this way, by the way. You can come here, we can go run model with this data. Oops. Ah, that's not gonna work. Somehow that doesn't work for the type checker. So ignore that and run it from here instead. Okay, so it's working. Now remember, H5, we sort of gave up <coughs> after 56 seconds. How does it go here? 439 milliseconds. So that's sort of showing you the power of the inverse view, right? So the point is that this constraint here, notice there's no exists, there's just conjunction. We just say for every number, it has to be next to its number plus one. Okay, there's a little bit of fiddling around here to map the 2D row columns into the 1D position values. But once we have that right, then everything works very, very efficiently. And that's sort of showing you the power of this multiple modeling where you have two different views of the problem. You talk about one constraint, so we obviously want to talk about the all different constraint in terms of the original view and setting up the clues is very important. We want to use the original view for that. That's the easy way to do it. But for that adjacency constraint, we want to have the other viewpoint. We want to say for each number, what, what position is it hiding in? Once we know that, then we can just check if those positions are adjacent easily. Okay, that's the end of task two.